Good day, Grade 11s. All right, let's finish off animal biodiversity. All right, so today we're going to do the six different phyla. We're going to look at periphera. We're going to look at cnidaria. We're going to look at uh, platyhelminthes, annelids, arthropods, and chordata, and then we'll be finished with this. Um, I have included the answers to the table I made you draw in the previous one. Um, so that you guys can actually get the correct answers and you can't moan that I didn't help you. <laughs> All right, so let's start with periphera. All right, so what you guys know periphera is is um, the Great Barrier Reef. What is the stuff made out of? Coral. Okay, so it's pretty much coral and it's a living organism. And you can see that at the top right hand corner there, they're actually filter feeders. So they inject this very neon green guy at the base of it. And it actually is able to move through the pores, which I'll show you in the next slide. And that is actually able to force out a whole bunch of that dye. And if it is not something that it um, actually wants to consume, it will just spit it directly out. And there's a whole bunch of cells inside of there that you can see at the bottom right hand corner um, that have um, flagella. And those flagella actually push the air out. And those cells are called collar cells that you can see on the far right hand side over there. I'm not worried about the ostrium and the atrium, the atrium and the spicules. Please don't worry about that. Please just note that the collar cells have the flagella and they actually push water from the bottom to the top and they absorb any kind of nutrients that are floating around. So on the left hand side, they're the simplest multicellular animals. Uh, they have no tissue layers because they're at the cellular layer of organization. So it's not like anything has developed into a double layer or a single layer. Um, remember, we're talking about diploblastic and triploblastic. This is kind of just a single layer of cells, which you can see from the bottom right hand side over there. And that single layer of cells actually causes um, everything to move around. So it's not like there's a double layer of anything, even though it looks like it could, it's not at all. Uh, they are asymmetrical. They're acelomate, they are sedentary, which means that they do not move at all. Okay, another word could be uh, stationary, but stationary is more for like an object. So sedentary means it just doesn't move. Okay, I like asking that word. Water with oxygen and food, mainly bacteria, is drawn in through the pores. Remember, bacteria is extremely small, so it's able, well, it's actually easier to eat. And the water leaves through the osculum. What is an osculum, sir? That is the top part of the actual periphery itself. Sorry, it's drinking water. Okay, and that is the almost mouth bit, if you will, but it's not really a mouth. So on the right hand side of there, you can see that the wall itself is made out of these collar cells and a bit of like an epidermal cell or a meboid cell. So even though it has multiple layers, it doesn't necessarily mean that they all come from the same individual. So this is more of a group of cells that just work together. It's more of a like colony as opposed to, um, uh, oh, it's gone, multicellular individual. Um, what else is going to say now? Oh, if you push this entire structure through a sieve, like you, you didn't like ram it through, but just kind of like evenly broke it out, it would be able to regrow over time. Okay, so you can actually take chunks of this off and move it around and we'll be able to grow back. Uh, remember, we briefly spoke about uh, corona sites in um, the previous section of work as well with um, plants. Um, these kind of go hand in hand, but we're not going to go into the bits and pieces of that. So uh, please also note that the periphera are aquatic and so are the cnidarians or cnidaria. So we don't call them the cnidaria. That's ridiculous. We know how to speak, um, you know, Greek and Latin. So we call them the cnidarians. They can take one of two forms, otherwise known as the polyp or sedentary, or which is sedentary, which means it doesn't move. And then we have the medusa, which is completely free floating. So at the top right hand side over there, you see um, a particular cnidarian called the jellyfish in its medusa phase. I will show you later on what the actual um, polyp phase of jellyfish look like. They are radially symmetrical. They have a diploblastic body and the surrounds the body cavity called the cilentron, um, which is filled with water. So it's almost serving exactly the same purpose as um, the, what do you call it, the periphera, but it works slightly different, okay? And at the bottom right hand corner over there, you can see something called the sea anemone. So both sea anemones as well as jellyfish 
and something I'd like you to go and Google called the Hydra, H-Y-D-R-A, and the Hydra themselves are also part of the Cnidarians and they're also radially symmetrical. All right, so now we have the um, we have the cells of the ectoderm have specialized to react to stimuli and catch and paralyze prey. So because we th these things don't often move, um, or they, they move extremely slowly and they're not very directional, they need a way of actually finding a way of killing prey because they actually need to eat. So the bottom right hand corner you can see over there I there's a um, gif of three nematocytes and oh, sorry nematocysts. So what happens is there is a trigger on the left hand side of that entire structure that looks like an egg. Once it is um, stimulated the entire structure opens and the nematocyst is pushed into where the venom is uh, forced out into the individual. Now it's been found that a lot of um, jellyfish and also um, what do you call those things a Portuguese man of war what's the correct word for them blue bottles um, the blue bottles also have these and um, you must actually go watch videos where they've caught a fish in their tentacles and um, or tendrils for that matter and then they actually like hit that f a fish multiple times and it becomes so paralyzed that it eventually moves it into its mouth part where it actually slowly digests it and all the like bits disappear directly out of the same hole. So the cells of the endoderm are specialized for absorption and digestion of nutrients. They have a mesoglia, okay, not a mesoderm, a mesoglia, and this contains nerve cells. Ooh, are we starting to recreate like some sort of cephalization maybe? So they have one opening or one mouth and is surrounded by tentacles. They are acelomate and they have no blood system whatsoever. They are so thin that they can rely on diffusion. They do not need to worry about a blood system. So this is the polyp version and the medusa version. So what you're going to find on the side over there is a bud. And from that bud, mitosis is going to occur where they're going to create clones of the original and they're actually going to pop off. If you'd like to go and watch a video on this, I really recommend it. Um, it's really cute. Um, and you can actually see how the Medusa inverts itself and lands. Okay. Um, so it literally pops itself outwards. And then it is like when it lands, it pushes those tentacles upwards. And that can mean it can still feed. So it's an upside down version of the Medusa, which is the polyp. Um, and it can still feed. So it can still move um, uh, prey and stuff in there. Also remember that the tentacles can also constrict. So they can be pulled towards the body or towards the mouth. So it's not like things just get caught in the tentacles and they stay there. They are, there is a basic nervous system which allows and makes the body understand that it should move towards the mouth. It also has a, a basic reproductive system over there and from the bud that is where reproduction is going to occur. Now we have one of my favorites called the Platyhelminthes. These are absolutely beautiful. They are also aquatic or live in damp places. They are parasitic or free living. There are a whole bunch of these that can infect you um, called fluke worms and can cause some really dangerous diseases. So I don't recommend you get infected. Um, not So the one on the screen, which is the blue one, is extremely large. Um, I mean, we're talking up to like 10 centimeters. Some of the fluke worms are maybe a couple of millimeters long and when they get into the system, they can actually cause a whole bunch of damage. Um, there's especially one that can actually swim up the urethra of a man and cause him to become completely impotent or like lose um, his uh, ability to produce sperm. So they, uh, bodies are flat and soft. Um, they're the simplest animals with bilateral symmetry. So this is the first time we find bilateral symmetry because Cnidarians were radial symmetrical or radially symmetrical. They also have a ganglia or a small mass of nervous tissue and sensory receptors in the head region. So on the right hand side of that um, flatworm over there, the platyhelminthi, you can see two little antenna like structures. Those aren't antenna, but sometimes they store some. Um, uh, it's more like a head or like two heads and they put a lot of their sensory receptors in over there. Sensory receptors as in an eye spot. So it's not something that can see, but it's able to indicate whether there is light or is not light. And then it can navigate its way around. Um, please also note that the bright colors that some of these platyhelminthes produce also indicate that if you eat them, you will die. Alright, now for my favorite little platyhelminthi or the planaria 
or planarian, you can notice that in the GIF over there, it has what looks like two eyes, and they are actually eye spots. And then it has some sort of structure underneath it, and that is its mouth part. Okay, it only has one opening towards the posterior or back part of the actual uh, worm, and what goes in there goes out. But it also has a branched gut, which means that it's not just a single tube, it's a tube that has many branches off of that. And that is to increase the surface area so that more digestion can take place quicker. They're also carnivores, which is really cool. So if you put like a little piece of mince, it like tries to eat it up, it's quite cool. They're also triploblastic with very primitive organs. We'll show you in a di next diagram. They are a coelomate and they have no blood system because they are still very small when i'm saying small these are barely bigger than or longer than about five millimeters they're so cute all right so these this is the cross section through the actual planaria itself so i'm just going to point out like what is underlined so you have circular muscles which allows for um something like your i'm trying to think of another version yeah okay your anus that is actually able to constrict and relax so it opens and closes the entire organism then you get on the right hand side the longitudinal muscle muscle which is able to shorten and elongate the entire structure which means they can really change their shape quite a bit um, they also have an intestine over there they have a pharyngeal cavity and they have a nerve cord okay this is important this nerve cord is where we're starting to find quite a lot of cephalization starting to happen because the cephalization is where all the nerves are occurring in the top part of the head so that it can have some sort of directionality it's also bilateral then we have the annelids they are aquatic or terrestrial in damp places okay so now you notice this is the first time one of these individuals are not relying on water specifically to live okay bodies are round and divided into segments this idea of segmenting the body up is extremely important um and you don't maybe necessarily notice it but you have um quite a couple of segments yourself so you have your head version, you have anything to the bottom of your lungs, and then from your lungs you have everything which is involved in the gut and digestion. So those are the three main parts, the head, abdomen, and thorax, okay, that mainly comes up in the insects, and you'll, you'll re hopefully remember those three words, the head, abdomen, and thorax. So your head is obviously your head, your abdomen is your lungs and ribcage and heart, and then your thorax is your stomach all the way to your anus. Um, and earthworms actually are so important in terms of these um, segments that you can actually cut it in one specific part and it will be able to completely develop a new um, individual. So other annelids that also fall part of this are, um, what are those worms that form in the gut again? Oh, I've forgotten. I'll put in the description of the video maybe. All right, um, they are triploblastic with tissues, organs, and organ systems, and they are completely bilaterally symmetrical please remember that when we're looking at the top it is bilaterally symmetrical if you're looking at it from its anterior part that is radial but we're looking at it from its dorsal part okay i can't remember the name of that worm you're probably shouting at the screen right now with the answer tapeworm there we go so tapeworms are also annelids and tapeworms are even worse so if you pulled a tapeworm apart piece by piece it could actually like each one of those segments create a can create a brand new set of individuals and each one of the things can become reproductive as well so when they pass out of your poop they land in water and then they'll reinfect another organism and each one of those segments can hold up to like 100 or 200 new different tapeworms please also remember that tapeworms were used as a way of losing weight many 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 moons ago then we have cephalization is extremely well developed concentration of sensory organisms at the front as well as a very simple brain so now we're starting to find a brain we're not calling it a ganglion remember ganglion is just a group of nerves we're talking about a very simple brain it has a through gut with a mouth and anus um, it is also coelomate which means coelom uh, provides a hydrostatic skeleton so even though it's out of water it still needs a hydrostatic skeleton because it has a cuticle on the outside which we'll have a look in the next diagram um, but it is important because there's also water on the inside and it still needs to be able to keep, be kept damp on the outside all right so um, they still have a slight reliance on water but not as much as um, or the previous phyla we were talking about. And here we can see a circulatory system is completely present because it is so long, it requires so much energy that it can grow
so much bigger now. Here is a diagram of a cross section through it. Um, listen, I don't expect you to draw this, please. I just want to point out a couple of things. There's also longitudinal muscles as well as circular muscles. It has a dorsal blood vessel, which means that it can move blood from the base of the body to the head of the body. We have a coelom. You can see that lovely open bit over there. We have a cuticle, um, which is made out of chitin. We have a nerve cord. You can see that it's transmitting um, uh, impulses across ventral blood system and CETA these are structures that push out of the body and actually allow the earthworm to hold on to while it's moving around then we have our arthropods our favorite little things our hojas our insects our little friends all right they live in all types of habitats and please note that they are very water independent they're not dependent on water um, even though some insects still rely very heavily on water for reproduction um, and remember not all insects look the way they do from the beginning a very good example of this would be um, mosquitoes or dragonflies so those are very dependent on growing up in water first before they exit um, even some beetles to a large extent they have to you know develop in water and then eventually move out of water when they're ready so invertebrates with joint uh, jointed appendages and an exoskeleton remember this exoskeleton is made out of chitin they are bilaterally symmetrical um, segmented bodies with specialized pair of appendage so pretty much on um, normally the um, abdomen you find either three pairs of uh, legs or six pa or three pairs uh, which leaves you with six legs you can either have four pairs we're making eight legs or you can have five pairs making ten legs all right so they you called your uh, hexapods octopods and decapods um, you can go and google all of those bits and pieces but um, we also have the millipede at right at the top sorry centipede at the top over there see i made the mistake and i was about to teach you how to tell the difference the centipede is the, called a centimeter because it's the equivalent of having a centimeter between each one of the legs whereas a millipede has um, a millimeter between their legs or the other way you can remember it is that millipedes have millions of legs but i like the whole million centi rather all right um centipedes are also extremely dangerous they are often like they will they will kill you left right and center and they've often been found to secrete very dangerous substances as well so if they're eaten or they bite you they will kill you so even in their death they will try and murder you these things are absolutely scary and they move at lightning speeds then we have scorpions over there you can count eight legs so they're part of the arachnid and then finally right at the bottom you have your little crab and they're part of arthropods as well which means that when you eat crab and or prawns and or lobster or crayfish or any one of those weird and wonderful things you are eating a insect how great is that okay we actually ruined my niece's life by telling her that one day she stopped eating prawns she's only recently started then we have a seriously advanced cephalization okay we have sense organs including a simple or compound eye we have antenna on the head which are now able to pick up a whole bunch of things i've also included the emperor moth at the top right hand corner just for those of you who freak out and i've included a little spider jumping towards the screen just to make you get the willies we have a through gut with specialized uh, sections um, and each one of those sections will act, almost act like you, like the equivalent of your esophagus, your stomach, your small intestine, large intestine, and eventually out of the rectum and anus. In a coelom with reproductive and excretory organs are found. Um, we have the coelom or also used as blood containing cavity. Okay, so it has blood. Uh, but it's completely open so there are random hearts placed along the inside cavity of the insect and they are open hearts which means they are sort of torpedo shaped and then they're open on either side and they have circular and longitudinal muscles that are pumping the, the inside li uh, liquid and that inside liquid is called the hemoseal now hemo meaning blood seal coming from the coelom so blood of the coelom uh, remember that insect blood as well is not red like ours and that is because our blood has hemoglobin and hemoglobin central atom is iron whereas in insects it is greenish blue and that comes from the uh, element copper okay so their entire systems are made out of copper now hemoseal is not necessarily good enough to um, be in humans and that's because hemoglobin is able to attach more oxygen than hemoseal <clears throat> then we have our chordata 
So I put a cute little axolotl on the right hand side over there and a little lizard or salamander on the left hand side. So they live in all types of habitats. They're the most advanced phylum. They have this thing called a notochord. All right, it's a dorsal connective tissue found in the embryonic stage, may remain into adulthood or is replaced um, by vertebral column. Majority of chordates have a vertebral column and an exoskeleton. So the idea of having a vertebral column is what makes us the most important part. The fact that you have a spine and the spine are made out of vertebrae, um, that makes a vertebral column, which means that you can now shove a, a spinal cord in it and you can connect to far more parts of the body, especially your pinches. So every vertebrae class has a unique body plan. Okay, they are completely different. I mean, inside over here, you're going to find your reptiles, you're going to find your amphibians, your birds, known as aves, you're going to find your, um, oh, it's just gone over there. You've got your mammals, which have your fur, and there's one more. I can't think of it right now. All right, um, the, they are bilaterally symmetrical with a high degree of cephalization. They really have what is now known as a head, what you have as a head. They are triploblastic. They specialize through gut is present. Um, they are well-developed coelom with specialized organs, and they have a closed blood system which developed heart and blood vessels. Okay, so now this means that, think about it, um, from, you know, when we spoke about our previous section on arthropods, all of those are really small, and that's because they have an open blood system. As soon as we close the blood system and we add tubes around the whole body, that allows for the body to grow really long and tall and big and allow it to grow a lot better. I mean, look at an elephant or a giraffe. This is the basic structure of all chordates, okay? So this is just showing that there's an eye spot, they're filter feeders, they have a pharynx with gill slits, so you notice this is, was very water-inspired. Oh, that's the other one, fish, okay? And they're known under the group of Pisces. Then we have um, a no nerve cord over there. We have a notochord underneath over that. Segmented muscles. So you can see that different parts of the body can move independently. Uh, we have a tail extending past the anus. Okay, and remember that a lot of our, our monkey ancestors have this tail. And a lot of other individuals, like a bird, has a, a tail. Uh, frogs have a tail. Reptiles have a tail. It's only when we hit mammals do we start to lose this idea of a tail that extends past the anus. And even then, some humans have been noted to grow a sort of tail um, because of atavism. It's a, when you go backwards in evolution, go and Google it, A-T-A-B-I-S-M. Then we have a pore of the actual cavity, which is also known as, um, well, like uh, for like movement of water. We have a gonad, which allows us for reproduction, esophagus, and the aorta, which is allowing blood to pump really fast. Okay, so if you didn't really get all of that, here is a table. Remember that you need to fill this out and you need to make this on a nice big A4 sheet so that you guys can learn. All right, hope that was good grade 11s and I will see you soon.